Have you ever wondered how biostasis works? Let us guide you through it. Medical biostasis is an advanced technology that aims to give you the best chance to live much, much longer than what is currently possible. But why do people want to live longer? Some people just love life and want to experience it for as long as possible. Some people are just curious about the future. They want to see what future cities will be like and what humanity will be able to achieve. Others think the world would be better and more fair if the length of your life was your own choice. There is no doubt that you will ever run out of things to do in a multifaceted world like the one we live in. In the end, the motivations are plentiful. But how can someone sign up for biostasis? First, you simply sign up with us and our insurance partner. It just takes a few minutes. To start, we only need some personal information. Don't worry, it's a simple process and we will guide you through every step of the way. Biostasis is achieved with the help of cryopreservation. Cryopreservation is a very advanced procedure that's still rather expensive and therefore not widely available. Tomorrow offers high quality cryopreservation with prices starting from 100,000 euros and going all the way up to 400,000 euros. Of course, this is a lot of money that few people can easily afford. But there is a solution. Together with our big-term life insurance partner, we offer a subscription model which brings the cost down to only 30 euros a month. About 90% of all biostasis contracts are funded via a term life insurance model. Let's say you're 30 years old and you want to sign up. The first thing you need to do is sign up with Tomorrow Biostasis and we automatically contract with our term life insurance partner for your coverage. Now, should you pass away during the coverage period, the term life insurance will cover 100% of the cryopreservation cost. You are protected from day one. Should you pass away after the coverage period, then unfortunately the term life insurance will not cover the cryopreservation cost. But of course there are other funding options for this situation as well. We make sure that our customers have everything in place well in advance. Furthermore, there is a high chance that prices will come down significantly in the future, as we work consistently to reduce the cost of a high-quality cryopreservation. Congratulations! You are now fully signed up. Now, should anything happen to you where current medical technology can't save you, like a terminal heart disease, cancer, or whatever it might be, and the worst case happens and you should die. Our team stands ready to pick you up and bring you to a medical research institute that is equipped for cryopreservation. Cryopreservation is an advanced procedure that uses medical cryoprotectant solution and very low temperatures to protect your body, and most importantly your brain, the part that makes you you, against degradation. We keep you safe and sound for however long it takes until medical technology will be advanced enough that revival is possible. While we can't guarantee, that is arguably better than any other option. Then, once technology makes it possible, we will revive you. Should you have gotten cryopreserved at an old age, then revival will only be done once rejuvenation technology is available and the human lifespan is much longer than it currently is. Sometimes people are worried that life in the future might not be as enjoyable as it is today. But if history has shown us anything, it is that the average quality of life keeps getting better during the years. Now, after revival, you are free to continue your life as fit and happy as ever. Of course, this is a complex topic where a short video doesn't really do it justice. We are more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Just reach out to us. Find out more. Well, 
Welcome to today's webinar, the Tomorrow Biostasis webinar series. As you can see, I'm not in Berlin, our normal studio today, um, but actually traveling and uh, in San Francisco right now. So if there's any technical difficulties, um, that might be due to that. So without further ado, I will start. And if there's any technical difficulties that can't be solved, then we will repeat the webinar um, next week and then go on with our series from there. All right. Now, today ado, will be about long-term storage and stability, that can't be solved, meaning what kind of techniques and uh, governance structures and then choices a uh, cryopreservation organization should make to All make right. sure that now, there's a high probability today, that any we'll patient with long time to do cryopreserve, any member who decides to do cryopreserve, meaning and then becomes a patient at some point, has the best possible chance of being revived in the potentially far future if and when should that make is right, sure, medically now, possible. High today, Let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Emil. I'm a doctor by training, a little bit of cancer research in the past as kind of my first part of my career, then built a couple of tech companies. Of course, some of you, or even maybe most of you, already know me. But for those right, who don't, uh, uh, short introduction. introduce myself. Um, uh, I'm Emil, I, yeah, I built tech companies, training, um, but always with the goal of going into the field of longevity in the long run. Since tech companies felt like the longevity field might not progress fast enough, I in the end decided to dedicate my time short to the to the cryopreservation field. Now I'm co-running two organizations. One is Tomorrow Bio, which is the day-to-day cryopreservation provider. Based uh, in Berlin, and then also the European Biostasis Foundation, which is a non profit research foundation based in Switzerland, and now newly also a core member of CryoDAO, which is an organization that funds very, very basic uh, research, research that otherwise would have a very hard time getting funded. As I said, um, this is a multi part series of this, of this webinar. We're currently in webinar number three, again about long term storage. And stability, and then there's going to be another nine webinars covering everything from cost to funding options to as I said, whatever this is a multi part whatever it is. Um, that I heard, I'm hearing people are hearing me twice again. You know, I'm currently on my laptop, then which is going to be the downside of not being our standard from cost to funding, not being our standard system. Okay, um, please let me know if you are still hearing me twice. I hope this is better now. Um, so if someone from my team can uh, confirm, otherwise I'm going on slowly from here and hope that everything is uh, is fixed now. Um, right. One thing before we, we get started with the content is that, of course, this webinar is always about um, having you know, an introduction part, having a, a part about, you know, giving an introduction to the, to the field or to the specific um, topic. Um, and then there's a part where, and this is also the a very important part in, in my mind, um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have, um, questions, um, you know, A to Z, what you might. Um, so it would be either through a service called Slido, S-L-I dot D-O, Enter the number you see here on the screen or scan the QR code on the right. Or you can also use YouTube chat. We're going to start always with the Slido questions. Um, the reason for that is those with that with that tool, you can up and down vote questions. Um, meaning if someone is interested in a question that someone else has asked, they can upvote it. So there is then a higher, you know, we, we take a higher priority to those questions because there might be upvotes. But YouTube chat is also fine. We're going to start with Slido and then go over to YouTube chat um, later. Now, the kind of when we always look how the whole you know kind of journey and through cryopreservation works. You know, we talked about you know sign up and then SST last time. Um, today will be about the cryopreservation part and specifically the long term part. Once every the long term storage parts. Once all the procedures are, are, are done, what happens then um, in the long term? Um, well, until as I said before, revival might be possible at some point. Now. When we talk about storage and, and stability, there are multiple factors about um, what, what makes an organization what, what makes an organization stable. There's kind of you know medical, like you know, the building itself, the location choice, the governance structure, and the financial part. 
Medical includes, you know, the doers, the types of types of um, um, cryopreservation storage, immersion and ITS, and so on. The building, of course, includes building, um, you know, choice where it is, how it's located, um, is it underground, and so on. Location, of course, should be low risk, should be in a country that is stable, um, has, you know, lo long-term stability, or at least a track record in history of long-term stability, and so on. Governance is highly, highly important, right? Uh, from nonprofit foundations to how the board is being set up, how what the st statutes um, allow and, and disallow, and so on. And last but not least, of course, also highly important, um, how funding works, how the financial aspects of long-term stability works. And of course, we do not know yet how long it might take until, until cryopreservation might possibly be reversible, meaning uh, revival will be possible. So it's very crucial, of course, that the funds are available to you know, practically do storage indefinitely. Since the financial aspects and the funding aspects of cryopreservation is a relatively complex topic with a lot of nuances and a, a lot of different options, uh, we have a separate webinar um, for that. So even though it kind of, of course, is part of stability and feel free to ask questions if you have any questions today about that. But in the next two webinars, um, there will be, uh, no, those will be dedicated to all the financial and funding aspects. Um, of the of the whole topic including the stability so now um let's start with the first part which is the medical aspect of of crime preservation what kind of types of of long-term preservation are available or are possible so the most known one you know when you saw doers in some tv series or on pictures at our organization and at other organizations Almost all of these doers are so-called immersion doers. And now, to be precise, not everything that you have seen is a doer. There are doers and there are so-called cryostats. Um, currently, to my knowledge, CI is the only organization, only the only major organization that uses cryostats. Cryostats has a, have a slightly different design, um, how the vacuum is made, and the other organizations are, are using doers. Um, we, for example, also use doers, Elko uses doers, and so on. And now within that, that um, framework, it doesn't really matter if it's, an, if it's a doer or a cryostat, um, the most common type of storage is so-called immersion storage. That means the patient is fully immersed in liquid nitrogen. The, the small picture you see here on, on the side uh, is, you know, of course, there's a lot of uh, artist uh, freedom involved, but one main factor would be here that the, the patient is, um, is turned around. Um, so the head is actually upside down. I'll show you in a, in a few seconds. Um, I bought more, more pictures on that. Um, but that is one of the, you know, one of the, one of the factors for storage, uh, sorry, for safety. Um, liquid nitrogen is at negative 196 degrees Celsius. One reason why these immersion doers are being used is because they're relatively comparatively to other types of storage, relatively inexpensive and simple to maintain. Simple to maintain means the only thing you need to do is refill liquid nitrogen. So if we're talking about you know, safety, then what an organization basically from the medical perspective, the only thing it needs to do is it needs to make sure that the doers are always filled sufficiently with liquid nitrogen. So relatively, uh, relatively simple and, and straightforward. Um, the second part is, yeah, well, this is the current, the current standard. The downside of these doers are that due to how cool down is being done, um, you, one, once you cross the so-called glass transition temperature, um, which is around negative 130 degrees or so, you need, to, um, you need to cool down further, of course, to negative 196. And since at the time of the glass transition temperature, the, the well, it's basically a glass, right? The, the vitrified state is like a glass-like amorphous state. And as everybody knows, this glass is kind of a solid, right? Um, Meaning, when you cool down a solid to, well, from negative 130 to negative 196, different parts of that solid um, cool at different rates, which generates thermal stress, which leads to what is called cracking or fracturing, which are, which are basically yeah, thermal stress-releasing fractures in the tissue, which, of course, you want to avoid. 
meaning for immersion doers, you need to cool down very, 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 very slowly to avoid the thermal stress that, um, to avoid the thermal stress that leads to fracturing. On the other hand, there is a type of storage, which is called ITS, intermediate temperature storage. People who have been in the, in our advanced webinars in the past, um, they've heard about that, that slide is basically copied from there. That type of storage um, doesn't store in liquid nitrogen, but it stores in the vapor phase above liquid nitrogen. So it's the same, almost the same outside doer. And then the liquid nitrogen is only on the bottom. And since liquid nitrogen boils off, above this liquid nitrogen, a vapor phase basically is, is you know, there's, there's a vapor phase above the liquid nitrogen. And that liquid nitrogen vapor phase um, has a temperature with certain, with certain uh, you know, gradient reducing um, insulation parts that you can then have at around negative 130 to negative 140. At that temperature, there's less thermal stress being generated. You cannot reduce it to zero, but you can reduce it significantly, meaning there's less fracturing and cracking. Currently, there are no whole body ITS doers anywhere. Um, we're the first organization, most likely, that will offer whole body ITS uh, storage uh, in our facility in Switzerland. We're currently in, in process uh, together with uh, 21st Century Medicine um, to, to develop and, and prototype these, uh, these doers. Um, and hopefully towards the end of the year, the first one uh, will be in Switzerland. And then ITS doer will be a choice for storage. The ITS doers, arguably, they might be slightly less safe, even though I'm not sure if that's a relevant difference. Um, but technically, um, they just have a bit less liquid nitrogen in the doer, meaning you need to refill uh, more often, um, which isn't really a fundamental problem. It's just the logistical, you know, you know, just the logistics need to be adapted, um, which. Yeah, I, I don't deem to be a practical problem, but theoretically, of course, um, it, it could be could be one under certain circumstances. The advantage, of course, here is significantly higher storage quality, but due to the doers being significantly more expensive and having more liquid nitrogen boil off, there are also more uh, that the storage in liquid in ITS doers will be more expensive. Um, we don't know yet exactly what the prices will be, but um, we will announce that soon once we know. Um, just for, uh, seek, uh, for, for, for sake of completeness, um, there's, of course, other types of, of storage as well, right? There are different fixation types, so, so immersion and ITS stores in most cases are being used for vitrified patients, right? Where you know, a cryoprotective agent has been used, then there was cool down, and then the patient goes in this vitrified state. But technically, you can also do long-term preservation in a fixed state, so a chemical fixation. And if you do certain types of chemical fixation, you can store at room temperature, even though it has some downsides. Um, one of the webinars that will come up, not sure exactly which one, uh, but in one of them, in one of the upcoming ones, we will cover the differences here in, in more depth. Um, you can also store at different, um, you know, four degrees, minus 20. Um, you can also store at liquid nitrogen temperature. So there's a lot of combination of, of uh, chemical fixation, different temperatures, and cryoprotective agent that can all be combined. Um, from a safety standpoint, if there's any, you know, let's say in the far, far future, um, hopefully at least there's any large scale geopolitical problems, let's say large scale wars and so on, something like that, that it might be um, helpful, uh, it might be helpful to um, convert um, vitrified st stored patients into, into fixed uh, patients, even though that is not, not easy if possible. Um, so different types of storage might, in, in very, very large scale geopolitical problems, have different uh, levels of, you know, safety and stability. Um, but of course, um, arguably in Switzerland, the risk of that is, is, you know, as low as it can be. Now, I said, um, these doers all kind of look the same. So here on the right, you see one of our doers that is in, in Switzerland. Um, that one is currently being run as an immersion. Doer. Um, technically, that design with small alterations that would not be really visible on the picture even, uh, you could also run it as an ITS um, doer. 
And then from a safety standpoint, here on the left, you see individual patient ports. So patients are, of course, in the duals, but each patient individually is you know, secured in one of these patient ports um, that gives some level of, you know, first of all, ease of, of transport and ease of relocation. For example, if you want to upgrade to a different type of doer, or, you know, again, if there's any larger geopolitical problems, you might, for whatever reason, want to relocate patients to another organization um, or to, your, to another facility that at hopefully in the future um, EBF will have. Um, that's one of the plans, of course, but might take a while. Um, so it gives you basically it gives physical, physical, you know, protection to the patient um, in these uh, that are then stored in these doors. Um, the the door storage in our case um, is in so the the room that you see here is this room. The room I'll show you in the next slide. The room is underground, so. Um, it's it's a large scale room that has for you know employee employee safety all these uh, metal tubing and metal uh, ventilation system that you see on the walls and the ceiling, um, those are there for uh, being allowed to store liquid nitrogen underground. As we know, we are the only organization who, which currently has underground storage. Um, so all of that part, what you see here is underground. Um, as you know, and as you see here, our building is kind of built into a small into a small hill. So it's not like deep underground. It's basically one story underground. Um, the storage room here, you see it on the on the left side. The storage is basically back here. So the 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 storage um, the storage facility goes further back than the upper level of the building underground um, so when you when you actually enter the the building uh, on the back side you're standing on top of the uh, of the of the storage uh, of the storage facility of the storage room and on the front we have two layers of of security um, basically two security layers uh, one of course is the outside wall and then even if you get in there you don't get into the storage room directly there's another level of of security doors um, before you then uh, are in the in the storage uh, facility. Um, the storage facility, of course, has a separate um, key system, so not everybody who is uh, at the facility or works at the facility is allowed to is allowed to go there. Um, only people who well need to um, and take care of either refilling doers or of uh, you know storing patients in in cryopreservation. Um, the the building in on the on the lower level is full concrete. So, um, you know, as much as you can reasonably do, um, I mean, before you, you buy a bunker, like an old bunker or like a mine or something like that, which of course would be prohibitively expensive. Um, but bar that, um, this is the most, the most uh, secure that you can within reason, within reason do. Um, if in the future, the storage location uh, would be, would run out of space, then we would expand to two directions in two directions underground as well. So for, for the time being, all storage at our Switzerland Institute will be underground. And then, as I said before, the long-term goal is to have multiple storage locations, potentially all, all, over, uh, all over Europe. Um, and when I say multiple, of course, initially I mean two, and then in the long, long future, uh, hopefully more. But initially two, um, maybe in Europe, maybe also in other geopolitical um, you know, locations like the US uh, and so on to if there is something, you know, in the very long term, even though I hope this will not be the case anytime soon, that you then have the opportunity to relocate the patients somewhere else. All right. Um, so why why did we choose Switzerland, Switzerland in the first place? Um, as you know, the um, part of the organization is from Switzerland. Part of it, including me, are from Germany. So we kind of have, you know, Germany and Swiss roots in the on the foundation side at least, but Switzerland was not a choice, um, you know, just due to due to simplicity. In fact, Switzerland um, is a significantly relatively expensive country compared to others. Um, we chose Switzerland for a range of stability factors, um, both from a legal standpoint, from a geographical standpoint, and of course from the historic fact of Switzerland trying to stay out of any military conflict as much as it can. So Switzerland, from all the storage organizations worldwide, 
Switzerland is the country um, that has that is best rated in regards to uh, peace fragility um, index and, and political stability index and any type of stability index um, that you can look at. Switzerland is from all organizations, the all organizations, all storage locations around the world, um, the best rated one. Um, of course, it's a very stable economy. Um, it's it has a low crime rate. As I said, it stayed away, stayed out of all military conflicts. And even today, um, where a lot of European co countries get involved in military conflicts, um, Switzerland is, you know, as much as it can, um, staying out of it for, for better or for worse. But of course, for long term stability, um, that is arguably a plus. Um, but not only from the stability um, values, but or stability factors, it also is a very liberal society. So a lot of stuff is, you know, allowed. People can make choices for their from their own. So it has a good amount of legal stability um, as as well. Um, and even though this is mostly more on the medical side, um, this this legal stability leads to these possibilities of potentially assisted suicide, at least in certain circumstances. Um, it's also it's reachable from everywhere, right? Um, oh, well, this is this one here. So, so the 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 facility is located up here on the Swiss German border, right? Easy to reach from the Zurich airport, easy to reach from Germany. Um, international flights from from anywhere. Of course, in standard operations, that just makes the facility location convenient. There's nothing really from a stability standpoint that is absolutely important to reach it, reach everything quick. But again. Planning for these, you know, large-scale catastrophes. Um, it's good that you have you have easy access to multiple directions, other countries flying away, if need be, uh, and so on. Um, the, the these are all the locations here that are currently, <coughs> well, are currently um, high-quality um, storage locations and, and facilities. Um, Switzerland is of course ours uh, in rafts. Then there's uh, CI in, in Michigan, there's Alcor in, in, in Arizona, and there's Southern Cryonics in Australia. All of these locations are reasonably safe from a geopolitical standpoint, uh, from earthquakes. Um, Switzerland um, in, in rafts doesn't have any, any relevant amount of earthquakes or other. There's no river close by. Um, there's no... You know, no, no hurricanes. Uh, you name it. There's basically nothing that is is like in uh, a risk factor that would be that would be relevant for long term storage. The other locations, um, apart from this political stability and so on that I mentioned, the other locations are also um, yeah equally good from that point of view. I think so. I, I to my understanding, to my knowledge, there's also no earthquakes, no hurricanes, um, and so on. Nothing that is really would pose any external risk to the to the long-term storage now let's talk about the next factor right so now we, we talked about the medical part we talked about the, the the location part let's talk about the governance part and i think this is probably one of the if not the most important factor um, for for long-term stability so governance means what is the legal legal structure that is set up? And I'll show you a bit more about different legal structures um, that we that we have set up. What is the legal structure? What is the governance um, model of who makes decisions for the patients which are in storage? So long-term storage should always be with non-profit organizations. The long-term storage prod should never be with a for-profit organization or, or anything that is not, not non-profit. The reason for that is that long-term storage might need to be maintained for a very, very long time. It might be decades, it might be centuries. Historically, companies, for-profit organizations are not good at being around for a very long term. Non-profit organizations, on the other hand, and especially non-profit foundations, have been pretty good at being around for a very long, long time. And you know, not only that, not only having been around for a long time, but also keeping its mission, keeping its purpose. So doing what they were set up to do. So um, EBF um, is a nonprofit foundation. Um, you know, the factor of keeping, keep doing what it was set up to do is, was a very important factor, was one of the additional reasons why we chose Switzerland, because Switzerland has a very strict foundation regulation and foundation laws. 
One of which is that once the foundation has been set up by the original you know, founders, then the foundation, even if the managing board, the foundation board in the far future should decide that they want to change it, the purpose of the foundation, so the reason why this foundation is around, cannot be changed. Right. So EBF is basically, you know, it, it's, it needs to stick to the fact that it, it does cryopreservation, uh, which is quite helpful. And of course, to never get into that situation where the board might even want to change something, um, the, the board is set up as a so-called self-amending board, meaning every board member has a certain term of how, li how long they're on the foundation board. And then the existing board members, if, for example, someone wants to leave or, or get, goes into cryopreservation or whatever, um, then the existing board members vote in a new board member. And of course, they now need to make sure that that board member is aligned with its mission and you know, kind of you know, keeps pushing forward the long-term stability. And I'll show you in a second that we will build up like specialized organizations for this, um, for this governance part. Um, we're currently in the process of doing that. Um, which will have even stricter rules and regulation of um, how these how these decisions can be made. Right. Additionally, for me, it's it's highly important that all the board members are intrinsically motivated. Right. I don't want anybody who just you know finds cryopreservation interesting or has any financial interest or whatever there might be. Um, the, the goal here should always be fully um, intrinsic motivation. <clears throat> And so, so all the board, I'll show you the, mem the board members in a second, and they've all been involved in the space, some of them for decades uh, with, uh, before uh, EBF and, and tomorrow and so on were set up. Um, and most of them, if not all of them, I think all of them actually in, in non-profit, um, in, in, uh, yeah, in, in volunteer and non-profit uh, positions, pro bono positions, where they didn't make any money uh, with it. Um, yeah, last but not least, as I said, I'll show you in a second, um, I'm, I've been thinking about more specialized uh, organizations. There will probably be multiple in the future um, that um, allow to ramp up this level of stability and, and safety uh, one more, you know, one more notch. Um, as I just said, so the board has all been involved in for a very long time. So this is the, the current the current board of of EBF uh, seven seven people, um, the original six uh, founders in the, the big picture, and then uh, Monica joined, joined after and is now also a board member. Um, and as I said, all of them have been involved in the space for a very like, long time. So um, Patrick here on, on the left, and then uh, Typhoon and Nikolai in the middle, they've been the, the founders and um, directors of CryoSwiss which was a non, yeah, non-profit, like a, a Swiss, organize, a Swiss association um, to advance uh, cryopreservation in Switzerland. Right? And they've been running that for not exactly sure how many years, but, but many, many years, um, you know, without any, without out making money or anything like that. Um, then uh, Torsten has been involved here. The second from the left has been involved in the space for many, many years. In fact, um, when I signed up for, for Elko before uh, setting up these organizations many, many years ago, um, he was the person that I, who helped me, helped me sign up um, for, for, for Elko kind of as like a, you know, yeah, as a pro bono, as a volunteer kind of support um, to help people sign up and answer all the questions that they might, might have. Stuff that, of course, now we do. Um, that was, and, and he also has been involved in, in Chronics Germany and other organizations for a very long time. And then on the very right, um, uh, Matthias, the last, uh, apart from me, the last uh, founder of, of EBF, um, has, a, has his own uh, private foundation where he funds basic science um, out of his pocket and has been doing that for a long time um, for that, that is relevant for cryopreservation research. So everybody uh, very involved and, and Monica um, now also is, is or has been apart from EBF is part of a foundation um, that is, is dedicated to uh, funding cryopreservation research and adjacent topics. So very, very important that, uh, that there's strong intrinsic motivation and no one is interested just you know, in, in making money or anything like that. Um, very briefly, um, some of you, of course, now know our structure, but just uh, very briefly, a quick overview of how the, how the structure looks. Um, so um, on, on one hand, we have, of course, tomorrow that does all the day-to-day -day work, right? Does the medical parts and so on, but does not do long-term uh, long storage. Um, second, you have then organizations that do long-term storage. So currently that's EBF, 
as I said, um, we're currently in the process of setting up more specialized organizations. The first one here will what we call Biostasis Patient Foundation, um, which is a which is a um, either Swiss or Liechtenstein-based um, foundation. So it also makes sense sometimes to have different countries for different uh, for different legal entities, at least in Europe. Um, most likely, though, it will be Swiss. Swiss. Um, which will have, uh, if you want to join that board, uh, the, the board will have significantly, you know, a long, long, long list of of rules uh, and requirements for for joining for joining the board. Um, and then, as I said, so that one might be Switzerland, and then the next one we might set up one in Liechtenstein. There might be advantages and disadvantages to those, even though I think both are totally fine, as is EBF. But uh, people can then, in theory. If they're highly involved in in the space and have like strong opinions about certain certain things, they can then choose that they prefer one over the other. Where you know, just from a personal personal risk, um, you know, understanding where do you th see risk, where do you well, not care so much. Um, you, you can then choose what kind of organization should be should be the one that takes care of your long term or maintenance of long term, even though the storage location will always be run by EBF. The other organizations will basically be the legal entity um, that then can make decision and manages the funds, for example. And just for completeness, um, the next one, there's research organizations. EBF, of course, also does research. Um, CryoDAO does research. EBF slightly more um, applied research, but also going into basic research and then CryoDAO more uh, basic research, but also some applied. And last but not least, an organization that we do not have yet, um, that is more in the in the long term planning. We're thinking about it once in a while, but it's not something that we are absolutely on the top list of the of the priority. Um, is uh, a, a long term asset man management organization that, if people choose to do so, could manage assets. So if someone dies and would like to have some of their assets. Um, in the in the potentially far future, then they would be able to give those assets to that organization, and then that organization um, would be uh, would have in statutes that it would try to give um, the assets uh, back uh, once someone is revived. So, to kind of sum up, um, we have these different factors of uh, of, of um, security, as I said. So. The doers and uh, the immersion or ITS, that's mostly a logistical organizational part, right? Where the organization makes needs to make sure that nothing happens um, there. The building should be highly secured, right? Underground, I don't think underground is an absolute necessity, but of course it gives some extra stability, um, you know, if, you know, I, I don't know what might happen if a car wants to drive into it, or I, I'm not sure exactly what uh, what the you know attack vector here would be, um, but it gives some extra extra stability. So do uh, concrete walls, different security levels. Not everybody can can get into it uh, into the room where long term storage is being done, and so on. Then of course everything should be built in a country um, that is stable, that where we don't estimate um, it getting involved in any wars or legal problems. Um, or whatever it is, and governance again, uh, probably the most important most important factor um, from from structure to the people who are in there. How how regulation is being changed, how decisions are being made. Right, um, you can read the the statutes of EBF on the EBF webpage. Um, so there's a lot of stuff where if changes need to be made, a high quorum is required. So a lot of people need to agree to those changes so that you always do everything with the least possible amount of risk or wrong decision making. To be fair, I think the other organizations are also well set up there. Um, part of when when we set up part of what we, we modeled um, our, our statutes after uh, was based on the Elcor statutes. I think Elcor did a good job of, you know, for you know decades doing what they were set up to do. Um, I think there are some advantages in Switzerland, and I think in our statutes we we, we improved certain things, but by and large, um, I think they also have good good statutes and have of course also shown that they're stable uh, and secure for for you know many decades and a very long time. And the last part of, of stability, as I said, uh, we'll cover that next time, um, or actually in the next two webinars, if I'm not mistaken, uh, will be about how we can make sure that an organization never runs out of funding, that there's always enough you know, money to pay for liquid nitrogen and maintenance and so on and so on. Right. All right. Now, starting with the questions on, on Slido. 
All right, the first question is, what about intermediate temperature storage? Will it be proposed in the coming years if understood? Uh, it will be proposed uh, in the coming years if understood correctly. The expected price, can people switch? Yes, so intermediate temperature storage is something that we're actively working on. Uh, when I say actively working on, um, we're actually there's a, a prototype, uh, the first version of an ITS whole body ITS doer um, is currently being uh, is currently being you know designed and built. Um, so that will definitely be around at some point. The expected price is a bit difficult to say since we haven't tested the doer yet. The effect will um, the the fact will be that um, the price will go up. But how much is not clear yet because it's mostly dependent on the uh, how much liquid nitrogen consumption it has. The doer itself, at least the first one, is significantly more expensive. So one doer for immersion storage is around 26,000 um, euros plus import fees and transport. So whatever it comes out to, maybe 30, 35,000 in the end. An ITS doer at it is at least 200,000 uh, plus transport and so on. So significantly more expensive. Of course, that's the first version. So most likely and hopefully the prices will go down. But when I say go down, they might go down to 100,000, maybe to 80, difficult to say. Um, it also always, of course, depends on how many people actually sign up and want ITS storage. So the price would probably go up instead of 200,000 for whole body storage, it might be 300, it might be a bit north of 300. I can't, I don't have the data yet, um, but of course we will announce once, once we know. Next question would be, besides the higher cost of intermediate temperature storage, is there an expectation of when that could be offered? Yes, the expectation would be um, probably that we will get the ITS doer this year and then I would like to, I, I'm, not, I'm not really hot on um, offering like new technology if it just came about. So I would like to test it just as we did with the immersion doers. Um, I would like to test it for a good couple of months before then we would be comfortable um, actually, you know, A, offering it and B, having patients stored in it. Um, and um, last but not least, can you can you switch? Yes, you can switch. The question though is if switching makes that much sense. Um, think about it right so if you start in an immersion door due to the cool down the the cracking has already happened so the fracturing because you had already the thermal stress and now yes you can go up again to negative 140 um there should not be any downside as um currently known um but the advantage is not absolutely clear the other way around, of course, would also be possible. So, for example, let's say you start in an ITS tour, and then for whatever reason, you know, geopolitical problems, money running out, I don't know, something, um, it wouldn't be necessary to have, uh, you know, less complex, cheaper storage, um, then it would be possible to bring a patient over into an ITS tour. Um, the, the reason why it is possible that in the future we might switch everything to ITS, even though the organization and there was a fight between the management and the owners and, and so on, at nonprofit foundations, that cannot really happen. No one has any financial interest there. Um, there can, of course, be in theory some disagreements, but then again, um, those disagreements... Um, so so that there is a structure in the statutes how these disagreements should be should be solved. Um, yeah, um, since, since there's no financial interest, um, and there are, there are, um, regulations, how these, how these disagreements would be solved. Um, I think the probability of like business disagreements, even though it's not really a business are reasonably low. Um, are there any news next one? Are there any news, um, projects about persuflation? Um, yes, so persuflation is a is a really interesting um, interesting you know type of of you know preservation technique, um, which basically means using cooled helium uh, in the vasculature to cool down uh, without without fracturing and without toxicity. Um, it's of course it's relatively early in in research, so it's not something that can be implemented right now. But um, we're definitely keeping an eye on it. And one of the projects that we're considering right now at CryoDAO is actually a persuflation project. So definitely something that we're looking into um, and plan to to open at some uh, offer at some point in the future. 
Um, another persuflation question. Let's see if this is something else. And um, also, couldn't persuflation research on organ potentially made by EBS be able to bridge the gap between con conventional medicine and, and cryonics? Yes, technically it could. The problem is the cryopreservation field has so limited amounts of funding that doing like you know other like kind of adjacent research, which is not directly for brain preservation, other types of you know preservation that can then be used for for, for cryopreservation. Um, it's not something that I'm super, super hot on. So I, I'd rather keep a laser focus on on improving, um, you know, human cryopreservation techniques. Um, that might change in the in the future. There might be like there might be a spin out, or I don't know if someone gives us, you know, twenty million. There might be I might change my mind there. But currently, with the amount of funding that is available, which is not a not not a problem for stability or anything, but it's not like I, we we should, in my mind, start like a lot of adjacent uh, research projects that would then not directly benefit our core our core mission. Um, is the Biostasis Patient Foundation the new the new name of the Tomorrow Patients Foundation? Um, yes, these are these are the this is the same the same uh, the same thing. Um, if the price prices end up changing, will Tomorrow handle the in insurer side of that if they set it up uh, to begin with, or how much would we get involved in that? Um, yes, so if in the future, for whatever reason, there are price changes, and the hope would be, of course, that the price changes is down, right? So that, that there's two, there's three things that could happen. One is due to economics of scale, the prices actually can go down. It's too early to say, but tentatively, that might be actually possible, um, not so far in the future. Um, but not sure yet when. Second would be there could be new technology like you know persuflation, like uh, ITS storage, and so on, which has at least initially higher prices. In that case, we would of course give uh, our members, 